My name is Don Lauder. The talk that follows, Genetically Engineered Foods and the Failure of Science, is based on a paper of the same title that is currently under peer review. It's ninth month of peer review. I start with a quote. Uh, it is beginning to dawn on bi biologists that they may have got it genetics wrong. Not completely wrong, but wrong enough to be embarrassing. For suddenly cells seem to be full of RNA doing who knows what. That's from The Economist just 18 months ago. And uh, referring to the Human Genome Project and how it has uh, sort of turned genetics upside down and uh, the basis for transgenics, of course, uh, being that old model. Okay, to start off, I want to just say why I do this, uh, why I'm doing this talk. I am an agroecologist for the last couple of decades. I design and analyze agricultural systems uh, based on the principles of uh, ecology. And um, these are non-proprietary methods, uh, these methods, of, and they've been uh, repeatedly, we've shown repeatedly that they've uh, they are competitive with proprietary approaches, market-based approaches of the agrochemical and the biotechnology industry. Yet the biotechnology sector receives not only enormous private investment, but I quote Science Magazine here, the lion's share of federal agricultural research funding. And that needs to change, so uh, there are you know, not enough jobs in this area there's a huge need and so uh, I saw that you know the situation and I need to address it I want to uh, educate people on this issue that non-proprietary methods should be getting most of the federal funding instead of a small sliver <clears throat> because the proprietary solutions they uh, they can get their private investment okay we are currently in a watershed era we have food systems based on patented transgenic crops, crops of insufficiently tested genetics. And on the other, uh, we can go in two directions. The food system based on patented transgenic crops of insufficiently tested genetics, which I will show. Or we can go in the direction of food systems based on a diversity of plants and whose genetic and protein integrity is intact and consistent with our own human coevolution with them. And this is uh, this refers to the rogue proteins that and compounds that are produced uh, in transgenic foods. So we have these two directions. We're in a very important time, and there has developed a major conflict, or is developing, a major conflict in science between, on the one side, companies, universities, scientists, and ag producers deeply invested in crop transgenics for the last 25 years, billions of dollars, uh, thousands of scientific careers, which is probably just as important or more important than the, the money. And many countries have based their regulatory policies on that of the U.S., and on the other side, we have an increasing number of scientific papers documenting serious problems with plant transgenics. We also have this major restructuring of the theory of genetics, which I'll briefly review, which has turned everything upside down and pretty much done away with the basis, the uh, theoretical basis for transgenics, for plant transgenics. And we have grassroots movement opposed to transgenic foods All right, this just some biotechnology terms, and the underlying uh, materials for my classes, the classes I teach, this last one was a botany class, genetic engineering uh, definition here, uh, where DNA from one organism is spliced into another. This process creates what are 
what are popularly known as genetically modified organisms or GMOs. Genes spliced into the GMO are transgenes and the organisms are transgenic. This is also known as recombinant DNA or RDNA technology. And the genome is an organism's genetic system. Okay, I wanna, this is a very important point here is that I separate food transgenics from pharmaceutical and industrial transgenics. And um, I, am, I am focused on the food issue. Um, pharmaceuticals and tra industrial transgenics is almost all bacterial. And bacterial genomes, the genomics and genetic dynamics of bacteria are, are, are very different from uh, plants and, and uh, animals. Uh, pharmaceutical transgenics, there are some, they, they, they are producing with crops, but I'm separating them because, for one thing, the pharmaceuticals are uh, usually just one compound or a few compounds. These are tested for purity, and you don't have these issues of rogue proteins and things, uh, to my knowledge. These are dispensed by pres prescription, so that if there are any problems, this is a, you know, it's like a super labeling uh, system, so that problems can be traced. Um, of course, I give the yellow and the red flags to grain pharmaceuticals and grain grain crops. Uh, these need to be restricted restricted to greenhouses, not grown in open fields, which. And they need to be transported in, uh, in uh, as hazardous materials. So there's a complete separation from the food stream. Um, food, on the other hand, uh, it's extremely important to, to maintain the genetic integrity of food. Foods consist of hundreds of compounds, a symphony of molecules, such as a tomato. And it is very difficult to track then the production of novel proteins and compounds that may be allergenic. So here is a list of the compounds in the common tomato. Uh, and this is a very different situation than pharmaceuticals. Uh, you have all these compounds and it's... Uh, so this is uh, the main reason why I separate these issues. And so I believe that most of the biotechnology industry, the transgenics scientists, are not involved with food transgenics. And, um, and so I am not uh, against the pharmaceutical and uh, industrial transgenics. We're talking about food here. Now, what is genetic engineering? What is the process? The um, Agrobacterium tumefaciens is a bacterium that infects plants and causes galls uh, by transferring its own genes into the genome of the plant. And this is the main, this has been the main uh, tool in transgenics, is uh, this agrobacterium. It hijacks the metabolic machinery of the plants by, uh, and it inserts its, its genes into the plant via plasmid. And so scientists have put the plasmid to use and invented transgenics. Um, by splicing in the genes uh, that they want into the plant. Now, I remember back in 19, mid, mid 70s, uh, when the agrobacterium, this, this whole thing was sort of discovered or it was elucidated anyway. I was in plant physiology class, probably, I think it was Bruce Bonner came in. Very excited one day that this process had been discovered. Well, this was the beginning of the entire transgenics enterprise. And um, so you have this, uh, they, they, they splice a gene out of something like a bacterium or a animal even or another plant uh, using uh, ligases and uh, 
things like that, and um, splice it into the plant. Now there's another um, <clears throat> an alternative to agroba agrobacterium was developed oh a decade ago I guess um, and that's the gene gun and tiny particles of gold or other metals are coated with the transgenic DNA and then shot into the literally shot like with a shot like a shotgun this is known as particle bombardment and so these two methods are used to transfer genes into plants now when uh, so the system of transgenics, of plant transgenics, they use three main genes in the gen, in the transgene package. The transgene itself, the for or the target uh, trait, which is such as herbicide resistance or an insecticide or a vitamin or whatever, and then they um, they will uh, also transfer in a an antibiotic resistance gene known as a marker gene so that they can when they're done they can dose the callus tissue with antibiotic and only the cells that have the transgene package survive so that's a marker gene and then the promoter gene uh, the cauliflower mosaic virus promoter gene is also included and this turns on the um, the transgene in the host plant. This is it's very important, and, it, and it's very important later in the talk because it is uh, an issue in the instability of genomes and in the uh, in these transgenic uh, plants and in the horizontal transfer. So we have the transgene for herbicide resistance or whatever, and then we have the marker gene for antibiotic resistance and the promoter gene used to turn on the the transgene within the host plant. Um, and this all happens on individual cells in callus tissue, which I'll show here. Each cell that comes through this process is, and has been dosed with the antibiotic and survives and therefore has the transgene package in its genome. Each cell is known as an, an event. And so when you read the literature, you'll see that the, these events, uh, they're, they're labeled as events. These crops will, a crop line will be um, uh, referred to as, as an event or the, the transgene inside it. So this is all done on callus tissue, this undifferentiated tissue, plant tissue. And then uh, after they have done this, uh, they apply plant hormones to get these the callus tissue to these cells to differentiate into plants. And this is all done in the laboratory. And things like the restriction enzyme technology is used, um, ligases to do all to to isolate the genes that they want and then um, splice them into to plasmids. So after this process there are thousands of transformed cells in the transgene package and a central problem of genetic engineering that is important to understand is that each cell has a different genetic makeup and the engineer has virtually no control over the nature of the insertion and I will be talking about this later. So what are the main traits? The two traits dominate the transgenics world. Herbicide resistance accounts for three quarters of all transgenic crop area. That's the glyphosate resistance or, or Roundup resistance, Roundup herbicide. And the main crops are corn, soy, cotton, and canola. But the, this, they've also developed rice um, and then alfalfa, which was approved in 2006, and sugar beet. And then there's also uh, insect resistance um, via the Bacillus thuringiensis toxin um, in uh, corn, cotton, potato, tomato. And then they will stack these two in the same line, in the same plant. 
and this is known as stack. Then there are other transgenic traits, the sterile pollen, virus resistance, delayed ripening, altered oil, reduced nicotine tobacco. These are all fairly minor. Main, the main ones are the Roundup Ready, or the glyphosate resistance crop, so that they can go over a field with and spray the entire field of soy or corn or cotton with glyphosate herbicide and everything, every other plant dies except the transgenic crop. Um, so transgenic soy, corn, cotton, and canola with these two traits make up 90% uh, of transgenic crop area in 2006. 75% um, of that the herbicide resistant, the glyphosate resistant soy. And the main countries are the U.S., Argentina, Brazil, and Canada. Argentina has, and Brazil have seen huge growth in the last few years. Okay, the development of regulatory policy and tra on transgenic crops, an important development was, uh, well, throughout the 1980s and 90s, the U.S. Supreme Court and the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office uh, supported the patenting patenting of genes and biological processes. And the landmark decision was in 1980, the Diamond versus Chakrabarty uh, in 1980, that uh, this involved living organisms, uh, a decision. In the 1980s and 90s, though, um, what I will show is that through scientific scrutiny of crop transgenics uh, would have stopped their commercial approval. Uh, FDA scientists warned of serious safety issues and scrutiny was recommended by these scientists but it was not carried out. This was due to the influence or the dominance of commercial interests over the re federal regulatory ag agencies stopped scientific oversight and so since then billions of dollars and thousands of scientific careers have been invested this lapse is now coming back to bite the biotechnology industry and the science community and bite them very seriously. So in the early 1980s, the biotech industry lobbied the Reagan administration not to not regulate the new technology of, of transgenic food products. And uh, the biotech in industry has been extraordinarily successful in developing a revolving door relationship with federal regulatory agencies where their senior management uh, would go in and take jobs as senior management at the Food and Drug Administration. And so the policy of, or the doctrine we call it, of substantial equivalence was promoted in which uh, the idea that transgenic foods are, were declared substantially equivalent to non-transgenic uh, or traditional foods and this this is the basis for transgenics. However internal FDA memos show that the overwhelming consens consensus among the agency scientists was that genetically that was that uh, transgenic crops can have unpredictable hard to detect side effects allergens toxins nutritional effects and they urged their superiors to require long-term studies before uh, instituting the policy of substantial equivalence. And since then there have been, there's papers in peer-reviewed journals, published peer-reviewed journals, that the crop safety tests were flawed that these decisions were based on. Here's a quote from the former head of biotechnology issues at the FDA. In this area of transgenics, the U.S. government agencies have done exactly what big business has asked them to do and told them to do. Here's another scientist from the EPA. This technology is being promoted in the face of concerns by respectable scientists and in the face of data to the contrary by the very agencies which are supposed to be protecting human health and the environment. This technology is being rapidly deployed with almost no thought whatsoever to its consequences. And so in 1992, there was a landmark uh, development. The policy of substantial equivalence was signed into 
the federal regulatory statutes by the FDA signed into the Federal Register. Okay, so markets and global perspective. Since the regulatory approval of transgenic crops, according to the Wall Street Journal, uh, $100 billion has been invested in all types of transgenics. Staggering, $40 billion has been lost, according to the journal. And thousands of scientific careers have been invested. Uh, in the introduction of new crops has been blocked uh, due to consumer resistance. So things like wheat, crops like wheat, lettuce, potato, dozens of others have been have been blocked from from approval. And so these transgenic foods companies, biotech companies, are having these difficulties in U.S. and Europe and Japan, and so they have targeted the developing world. And so here's a quote from an annual report of the Monsanto, of Monsanto, the large, by far the largest company in this area. Full adoption of GM crops globally would result in income gains of $210, $210 billion per year within the next decade with the largest potential gains occurring in developing countries at a rate of 2.1% gross national product per year. I have that cited in my paper. 2%, 2.1% of the gross national product of these developing countries, that's the target. Assisting in the promotion of transgenic crops and foods are USA, US Agency for International Development, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Gates Foundation, Countries uh, like India, Thailand, Indonesia, Eastern Europe, and Mexico are all subject to intensive promotion. African governments are facing enormous pressure to endorse and adopt genetically modified crops, according to scientists there. And here is an article from this year with the food crisis happening. U.S. is using the food crisis to boost bioengineered crops. And this is, the Bush administration is instituting this, that, um, that transgenic crops be promoted <clears throat> around the world in these developing countries. However, a problem for the transgenic indus transgenics industry is the myth of high yield, of, of the high yield of biotech crops. And study after study, the yields of transgenic crops are equivalent or a few percentage points lower than the yields of conventional non-transgenic crops. And so this comes back, we'll be referring to that. Um, okay, genetic and nutritional problems with tran transgenic crops in the process of transgenics. This is sort of the basis of this talk. The central doctrine of genetic engineering is the one gene, one protein doctrine, and this has been for some years. Uh, however, in 2007, the results of the Human Genome Project came out, and instead of having the 150 to 200,000 genes that they thought humans had, the study came out with a shockingly low number of 30,000 genes, and there are 1 to 2 million proteins in the human body, so the one gene, one protein doctrine really was uh, pretty much obliterated at this time. And quoting an article on the New York Times on this human genome report, to their surprise, researchers found that the human genome and many higher organisms uh, and any other higher organism like a plant might not be a tidy collection of independent genes after all, with each sequence of DNA linked to a single function. Instead, genes appear to operate in a complex network and interact and overlap with one another, with other components in ways not fully understood. According to the Institute, these findings will challenge scientists to rethink some long-held views about what genes are and what they do. It's a very important development. So we're looking at, you hear terms like the fluid genome, and the genetic systems have emergent properties, uh, epigenetics, multi-layered, uh, systems. Uh, here's an article from Scientific American, The Unseen Genome. Lots of new stuff. 
is a quote from Barry Commoner, the fact that the one gene can give rise to multiple proteins destroys the theoretical foundation of a multi-billion dollar industry, the genetic engineering of food crops. Okay, I have to kind of go fast here. Now, this is a paper, this is the paper that really changed, really got me to do this. I had been uh, looking at, you know, and, and watching this, this transgenics issue for, for some time, not real, didn't really understand what the problem was, what was going on, and this paper came out in 2006, two years ago. The Mutational Consequences of Plant Transformation in the Journal of Biomedicine and Biotechnology, and it really got me, it, it, it gave me the basis for what, for these problems that have been occurring, uh, the genetic basis, and what they show, they, they review the literature. These are scientists from the UK, what they found was that mutations, they found mutations at transgene insertion sites include deletions, rearrangements of host cr chromosomal DNA, uh, and uh, they looked at both agrobacterium and particle bombardment of plant material. Uh, they see insertion of multiple copies, uh, sometimes interspersed with fragments, only a handful of studies have provided detailed data on this, however. And um, we find the sequence of functional transgene insertion sites resulting from particle bombardment has never really definitively been compared to its undisrupt undisrupted site insertion. So the work just hasn't been done on what really happens in this transgenics process. There are only five studies which researchers have attempted to quantify mutations, to quantify the mutations. And so the results are broadly consistent. They consist, they suggest that plant transformation procedures typically introduce many hundreds to thousands of genome-wide mutations. And these are not trivial. Uh, they affect the wholesomeness of food and feed uh, pro uh, that we eat. And so just in this year, we're getting um, almost all from Europe papers which are starting to elucidate what exactly happens. And uh, so you have protein upregulation and downregulation and things like this. I don't have time to go into these, but um, this pa the paper, the, mutation, the Mutational Consequences paper, uh, really gave a basis then for many of these, uh, or for these red flag incidents that have occurred in the history of genetic engineering, starting in the 1980s with the the, the tryptophan issue, where tryptophan that's uh, from genetically engineered bacteria uh, severely sickened up to 5,000 people, 38 people died. Then in the early 1990s, in one of the first major plant uh, experiments, they they transferred a simple gene into, from Brazil nut into soy and to, to get better uh, amino acid composition. And it inexplic inexplicably transferred an allergen as well. And they just didn't understand. They shelved the project and didn't really understand what was going on. The flavor saver tomato in the early 1990s, there were problems with that, uh, even though, although it was, despite objections of uh, the objections of FDA scientists, it was approved. But uh, rats and in initial tests had problems, stomach lesion problems, things like this. The Starlink incident, um, which is a variety of, of animal feed corn, uh, a small amount contaminated the human, the corn in the human food stream. And so the Starlink incident, uh, in which a number of people were, uh, thousands, hundreds and possibly thousands of people were sickened, um, by only a, a you know a percentage, one percent or so contamination of this by this animal feed corn, transgenic corn, the um, and this underlines several points. The separation of, of animal feed from food from in the food stream is difficult. That a very small percentage contamination can uh, uh, can make for a major ep epidemic. And that food contamination epidemics can go undetected because, uh, partly because we don't have labeling. 
we have uh, not successfully not been successful in getting labeling. In Britain, soy allergies jumped by 50% after the introduction of genetically modified soy. We in the U.S. can't really track this because of labeling. Uh, we do we do not have labeling of genetic of transgenic foods, so it can't can't really be done. And then there were, have been a number of studies have come out um, on the genetics of these transgenics that I'm just going to whip through fast. Uh, liver cell problems. Um, this are, these studies are usually done either on transgenic uh, corn or soy. Um, testicular problems with testicular cells. Uh, certain enzyme problems in, uh, in change in or, or organ-specific enzymes. All of this research comes from Europe. Then we have incidents in India where transgenic cotton has traditionally been grazed by villagers, animals, and uh, when they changed over to BT cotton, uh, there were incidents of um, hundreds of livestock dying uh, after eating this and uh, also incidents of the workers uh, having allergic reactions. In the Philippines, approximately 100 people living next to a BT cornfield developed skin and respiratory problems and tested positive to the BT toxin. Um, this was a big development in 2006, an Australian project to engineer a pest pesticide into peas and what they found was a problem with glycosylation which is a something they don't normally look at in the test so none of the foods that we have here have been tested in this way but they found that this that uh, there was a process of glycosylation that went wrong that caused severe immune uh, responses in, in mice so they, they, they shelved that project. We have issues of horizontal transfer of transgenes to human and test animal gut bacteria, the bacteria within the human gut. And the Swedes are doing this research. Uh, in a UK experiment, they showed, uh, it was shown that food, uh, transgenic soy, passed through the stomach and into the digestive system and, and showed up, the transgenic DNA showed up within the uh, digestive system of the, of the humans. And so, um, I won't go into this, but I'm, it's, it has been shown that the cauliflower mosaic virus promoter uh, <coughs> gene is active in these bacteria uh, cells in, in the uh, human and, and uh, mammal digestive system. And this is a serious issue because we have antibiotic resistance uh, in these uh, transgenic foods, and we depend on antibiotics. And another paper on horizontal transfer, um, and this having to do with viruses. All of this is modulated by the cauliflower mosaic virus, which is designed to transfer, to, to, to transfer and uh, and to uh, move genes around and turn them on. 1997, the gene, there was a paper that showed gene silencing in transgenic plants, which is a serious issue. This was in Petunia. Then there's a Pustai study, the Ar Dr. Arpad Pustai at the Rowett Institute in the UK. Uh, he was a gen genetic engineer, and he uh, developed uh, potatoes, uh, that had an insecticide. Um, he fed the transgenic uh, potatoes to rats, and due to the transgenic, we showed that due to the, the process of transgenics, the process of genetic engineering, these problems uh, developed in, in the potatoes. The rats developed precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, had inhib inhibited brain, liver, and testicle development, and a lot of health problems, serious, rather alarming health problems. Uh, Pusai released his results before waiting for the peer review, and this is this is a common.
practice in medically important research. It is not, it did not set a precedent. It, uh, it's been done scores of times uh, because the, the European Union was near to approving these transgenic foods. Well, Pustai was fired, legally gagged, and his research team disbanded. And it has since been shown that this, the supervisors of the, his supervisors were heavily invested in the transgenics uh, enterprise and industry. And to this day, the post study is the best designed study and carefully controlled study of its kind. Um, and this was uh, a quote from 2005, because we're starting to get other studies. Uh, I will talk about one later. But uh, the post incident um, underlines what happens to, to scientists that who go against this, uh, who are not compliant with transgenics. And so we don't have many studies. By the beginning of 2007, there were only about 20 peer-reviewed animal feeding studies on GM crops. Only a single human feeding trial has been published. And then in 2007, a paper came out in Critical Reviews of Food, of food Science and Nutrition, Toxicity Studies of Genetically Modified Plants, a review of the literature, and the conclusion was at the very end of the abstract question, where is the scientific evidence showing that GM plants foods are toxicologically safe? There is simply, the research simply ha is, is deficient. Here's another quote uh, from um, the head of the Cellular Neurobiology Laboratory at the Salk Institute in a peer-reviewed journal. There are, in fact, no data comparing the food safety profiles of transgenic versus, of GM versus conventional breeding and the ubiquitous argument that since there's no evidence that GM products make people sick, they are safe, is both illogical and false. There are, again, simply no data or even valid assays to support this contention. Without proper epidemiological studies, most types of harm will not be detected and no such studies have been conducted. This is August 2008 paper. Now, in November 2008, a major paper has just come out weeks, a couple weeks ago, where it was commissioned by the Aust Austrian government, um, multi-generational long-term studies done on, on rats reveal that, uh, or mice, that uh, the mice fed transgenic maize produce fewer and smaller litters, and there were differences in gene expression and so uh, showing up only in the multi-generational studies. In other words, the, where they, they fed rats just for one lifetime, no reproduction, they didn't see differences. And this is, this is what has been the basis for all of the previous studies. Okay, so, and reproduction, of course, is a very important uh, barometer of, of health. And then also in November of this month, uh, the Italian government just came out with a, a study that um, the uh, that the gut and peripheral immune response to, of course, it's now known that 80% of our immune system is based on the on our gut, on the bacteria within our gut, and that uh, the ingestion of of transgenic crops is changing this and there are serious ramifications with, with that. That's just this month. Another issue is transgene instability. Uh, French researchers found that transgenic crops are prone to genetic inst instability and that uh, the transgenes of these varieties are different than those described by the company of ownership. So uh, they're unstable and again, this is this another paper that, paper that showed this, a 2003 paper that recently has been re-examined, and they um, show that uh, there are rearrangements and that these the genetic composition no longer match the genetic maps provided by the companies. And so this finding is important, I think, in uh, looking at on these. Uh, toxic and allergic reaction incidents in India and the Philippines where uh, in the U.S. they may feed cotton 
transgenic cotton stubble to animals and not have any effects, but in these other countries, uh, they are getting toxic reactions, and that uh, may be related to this instability of the transgene. Now, one of the problems they have in doing this research is that scientists can't get the needed transgenic seed material from biotechnology companies in order to do the research. So this has been a, a real problem. Okay, so in summary, Arpad Pastai, uh, quote from him, a consistent feature of all these studies done, published or unpublished, indicates major problems with changes in the immune status of animals fed on various GM crops and foods. And a quote from The Lancet, the most important medical journal in the world, it is astounding that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has not changed their stance on genetically modified food adopted in 1992. Okay, so I've talked about these internal genetics, the mutations, uh, a little bit about external genetics, the horizontal transfer issue, genetic instability issue, and then there are ecological issues, transgene escape, and um, in case we have the mutations caused by transgenics, which can cause unknown proteins and things like that, horizontal transfer, we have the issue of antibiotic resistant bacteria because there's the gene for antibiotic resistance. We have the instability, and then the ecological issues. Uh, as a result of the 15-fold increase in the use of glyphosate herbicide, um, there have developed, been de uh, developed uh, incidents of, of herb herbicide-resistant weeds. Now, this is not a transgene transfer issue. This is simply overuse of a chemical and the uh, uh, driving the selection, selective forces, so, so the select genetic selection of herbicide-resistant weeds. Now, up to a dozen species now in Argentina. <clears throat> and then other problems such as pest resistance to, to the Bt crops, um, and secondary pest outbreaks in the Bt crops, and then the effects of Bt crops on, on the, f uh, the flora and f on the fauna. And then we have the uncontrolled gene transfer issue to wild and domestic relatives. And this is uh, a pretty serious issue. Pollen migration and seed escape have uh, resulted in gene flow to transgen to, uh, from transgenic crops to non-transgenic crops, as well as to wild relatives. In other words, uh, wild plants that are relatives of the transgenic crops, such as the brassicas. Okay, so how did this entire situation come to pass? Um, uh, the approval onto the market of transgenic foods and feeds. And why are people in the United States seemingly untroubled by a technology that causes Europeans so many difficulties? I have identified six major factors, uh, the first one being a real big one, in this uh, failure. So we have university dependence on industry for science funding. That's, that's a big one. We have the monopolization of expert scientific bodies on transgenics by pro-industry scientists with vested interests. We have deficient scientific protocols, bias, and possible fraud in industry-sponsored and industry-conducted research. We have um, increasing politically and commercially driven manipulation of science within the federal regulatory bodies, such as the FDA and the EPA. And then we have tolerance of, of manipulation of the information envi environment and uh, a biased treatment of, and harassment of non-compliant scientists. And then finally, uh, the count up the publications focus of the university tenure system favors narrowly focused scientists who tend not to ask questions outside their area of research. So I'm going to go over each of these just a little bit. University dependence on industry for science funding. The big development here was the Bayh-Dole Act 
of 1980, which restructured the financial re relationship between private industry, between university and private industry, and increased university dependence on industry money. And so we have the development of academic capitalism and the knowledge economy. The uh, science, you know, the, 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 the Science community predicted its own failure with this development. Um, this was, uh, there was a quote from Science Magazine, but the best quote is from Derek Bach, the former president of Harvard University, reflecting on this development. At the outset, profits seem to be made, the profits to be made seem all too tangible, while the risks appear to be manageable and slight. The problems come so gradually and silently that their link to commercialization may not even be be perceived. And I have a quote from Paul Gepps here at UC Davis referring to transgenics research at the University of California. There's almost no component that looks at the consequences of biotechnology. And so uh, because the funding has come from, so much funding comes from industry that there's, they, they don't have the incentive. And so in addition to the $100 billion in private investment that universities have gotten, the USDA has dispersed $1.8 billion for biotechnology research. Approximately 1% of that has gone to risk-related research. And then we have issues of conflict of interest within the university system, such as represented by the Ch Chapella, Ignacio Chapella tenure denial at UC Berkeley, which he eventually did get, but uh, members of his committee had interest in the biotechnology industry and didn't want him on in their department, on the faculty. We have issues of professional inertia. Here's a quote from a scientist that once you narrow down to genetic engineering, your skills are very much in that area. You can't just say, you can't just zip over to another area. And so we have scientists just uh, not knowing anything else to do. So why have so many scientists remained silent on the issue of transgenics? Um, well, if you speak out against transgenics, you are viewed as anti-technology and anti-progress, for one. And uh, inexplicably, the tenure system seems not to have been adequate incentive for scientists to, to dissent on this issue of transgenics. It's very disappointing. Okay, so that's the university dependence on industry for funding. Monopolization of expert scientific bodies on transgenics by pro-industry scientists with vested interest in transgenics. This is related. Here's a publication by the um, uh, National Academy of Sciences, uh, the Safety of Genetically Engineered Foods. Central theme of the book is that genetic engineering is part of a continuum of manipulation of plant genetics that starts with traditional crossing and so it's this is the this is a, a well-worn uh, propaganda uh, piece that that everybody is given that this is just a continuation a progression of plant breeding which I think I've shown is not the case. Here's another from uh, here's a, there's a chapter in the book entitled "The Adverse Impact of Foods on Human Health." Okay, so you can see where they're coming from here, they see where they're going. And then in another chapter, the unintended effects from plant breeding follows the same badly stretched logic that uh, discussing the re relatively rare cases where traditional plant breeding gives rise to foods with allergens or nu nutritional problems. And in the press release of the book, the genetic engineering poses no unique health risks that cannot also be, arise from conventional breeding. And then we have an, another expert body, the Pew Initiative on Food and Bio Biotechnology. And there's a quote from, from them that is used a lot. And uh, In fact, I heard this quote from a cooperative extension agent just a, a year ago. In some ways, genetic engineering is more precise than conventional breeding because scientists know what genetic material is being introduced. And I think I've shown that that is clearly not the case. And so in 2007, they still have the same tech. Nothing has changed. That was uh, referring um, 
there was a, a scientist uh, who was formerly with the U.S. EPA, a biotechnology specialist, transgenic specialist, and his quote is, as well as many industry representatives behind this report, there are also long familiar genetic engineering promoters. There is no one I recognize who has been seriously critical of any aspects of transgenics. The report reflects the one-sided input sometimes to an almost bizarre degree. So then we have a 2008 issue of Science Magazine from the AAAS on genetic GM crops, the world view. And we have an editorial. And in that editorial, look at the, here, here's, here's the disinformation. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Talking about increasing yields, transgenic crops, increasing yields, and decreasing the use of pesticides and herbicides. Um, but despite a quarter century's experience and billions of acres of GM crops, there are many nations that remain adamantly opposed to food, to GM foods. Um, and she advocates a simplified regulatory approach uh, to the accumulating evidence of safety. So it's just mind-bogglingly <laughs> ignorant, I guess. I mean, I don't know. This was an editor, of, so she's not really a um, specialist in this area. Of course, it's found that glyphosate herbicide is increased by 15 times. Atrazine and 2,4-D. There's been some decrease in insecticide use. However, a report, a 2008 report from actually Friends of the Earth International over in Europe, they've, they've done a couple of really good reports. They're not peer-reviewed, but they are, they are well documented. They, they're cited, um, good citations, um, and they show that uh, they talk about the whole issue of the, the yields are not, yields are actually lower than conventional crops and the increase in, in uh, overall pesticide use and how uh, these crops are not beneficial to these developing countries. Okay, then we have deficient scientific protocols, bias and possible fraud in industry-sponsored and industry-conducted research. And here's a paper that showed that the, the crop safety tests were flawed on the, uh, the Monsanto uh, corn. And this has been an issue that is ongoing, and there is a lot of evidence now. Um, French researchers took uh, several years to legally force Monsanto in France to release what should have been publicly accessible data. And when they anal analyzed it, they found major flaws in the data analysis. And they are alleging fraud. Um, and so Europe is now po poised to ban this transgenic corn. Uh, there are significant, they, they say there are significant def deficits in the statistical evaluation of the Monsanto uh, data, right? Um, and yet these uh, lines of corn, transgenic lines of corn, are currently grown in the U.S., Europe, Australia, Canada, China, Japan, Mexico, and the Philippines. And this is not only happening in transgenics, it's... Um, Industry-sponsored research has been shown to be pretty much a sham. Uh, here's one where the studies that were independently funded had zero, or the, the, the company, the, the industry-funded uh, ones had zero unfavorable conclusions out of 206 studies, while 37% of the independently studied, uh, in, independent ones had, um, showed up problems. Here is an even starker one where 90% of independently government-funded uh, studies showed problems, well, whereas zero of the industry-funded studies uh, showed problems with this, uh, with BPA, bisphenol A. Um, and the same thing with the studies on aspartame, zero from the industry, and 100% of the independently-funded studies were asking, uh, had negative outcome or had serious questions. So this is an issue. Um, and so the, the feeding studies have been shown to be just virtually a sham uh, that the industry does. And I will show some uh, results of more thorough studies in a minute. Increasing politically, actually, no, I already showed that. That was the Austrian study. 
um, that that showed uh, the uh, mul the multi generational problems. And so the industry tends to do everything they can to shorten and to minimize the effects of any any negative effects of these foods. Then there's increasing politically and commercially driven manipulation of science within the federal regulatory bodies. Uh, you have surveys of FDA scientists. Over half, almost two-thirds, knew of cases in which political appointees were uh, interjecting themselves into the ter determinations. Okay, And the same in the EPA. And we have tolerance of manipulation of the information environment. I'll spend a little more time on this because it's so important. Um, so we have government publications promoting genetic engineering. We have University of California publication here uh, talking about regulation as a challenge, is that regulatory challenges. In other words, this regulation really doesn't belong there. Here is a um, article by the uh, the British equivalent of Dennis Avery, uh, Anthony Troabas, Tro uh, the cult of the amateur in agriculture threatens food security, and uh, saying that uh, scientists who are marginal to agriculture uh, and a variety of unqualified groups are interfering with this process of, of agricultural development. And so that's, I guess I am one of those, I am a marginalized scientist. So. Um, and uh, then we have genetic engineering is needed to feed the hung a hungry world. And we have Norman Borlaug and Jimmy Carter gotten into the act in this uh, industry website. Um, guilt is a um, common tactic. The real issue in this world is not biotechnology. The real issue is starvation. That from the University of California spokesperson who we all know who she is. Um, and the U.S. then using this whole food crisis to promote bio, bio, uh, transgenic crops. And yet from the people who work in these countries on the ground, in the trenches, um, we're getting quotes like this, biotechnology, and this from a Christian aid group. Biotechnology and GM crops are taking us down a dangerous road, creating the classic conditions for hunger, poverty, and even famine. Ownership and control concentrated in too few hands and the food supply based on too few varieties of crops planted widely are the worst option for food security. So this goes against all this information and publications and, and uh, that we're getting. So African delegates, uh, delegates from African countries objecting to the promotion of these transgenic crops in their country. Then there's the Chapella affair. And um, Ignacio Chapella and David Quist, as a graduate student, showed in 2001 that corn transgenes are being transferred to, to native corn in Mexico. And as soon as this was published in Nature, there was uh, an aggressive industry-driven dr disinformation campaign against his research. And enormous pressure was put on Nature to retract the article. Uh, Nature could not retract the article because it was, it was basically robust. However, you saw reports like this, doubts over Mexican GM Mays report. And he has, and uh, if you talk to scientists still, they, they will say, well, Chapella's research, yeah, it was called into question. Well, it was shown by this guy, this investigative reporter out of the UK and The Guardian, George Mombio, that uh, this campaign against Chapella was promoted by the industry and they actually created phantom scientists on, on the internet and sent, sent messages from them. Uh, and then there was a flood from the rest of the scientific community uh, to retract this paper. Um, it was not retracted. Nature actually uh, uh, printed an apology that they shouldn't have, have, uh, have um, published it. And then just this month, actually it's not even published yet, but here is Nature of November showing Mexican scientists' results that, indeed, uh, Chapella's research was good. Uh, and uh, these attacks were all uh, spurious on him. And this is a, 
this, this I guess, shows what happens when scientists do their research that, um, you know, that uh, goes against the uh, mainstream. So it's, um, it's a bit scary for those who are in, uh, in uh, this area. Okay? The message is clear. If you do your research against or do this kind of talk that I'm doing, I don't have time to go into the Ermakova incident, but there was um, Ermakova didn't hasn't published her research on rats uh, being fed transgenic soy, but she was um, sort of ambushed by the editors and scientists involved in Nature Journal, um, and that's an ongoing in incident. She was uh, her results were um, she was very unfairly treated by Nature. Don't really have time to go into that. Then we have the publisher parish focus of university tenure system favors narrowly focused scientists who tend to not to ask questions outside their areas. And that, how do we approach the future of world food production if we're not going to know that our um, agricultural methods that we've developed that are non-transgenic are adequate um, and uh, can perform? Okay, so the there was a major report in 2008 put out by the World Bank called, known as the International Assessment of Agricultural Science and Technology. They reject biotechnology as the basis for future food production. And they back tried and true sustainable production methods. Okay. Um, and indeed, non-transgenic breeding methods have developed a number of crops. Allergen-free peanuts, salt-resistant wheat, a carotene rich sweet potato, things like this. Uh, there's a method, the biotechnology method known as marker assisted selection, which um, is not transgenic and which is, uh, can be used to do this type of research. So it doesn't mean we stop the biotechnology progress, we simply have to look closely at transgenics. And then there are studies of of the yields of uh, crops. Here's one that just came out a couple of, uh, just a month ago um, from the United Nations, Organic Agriculture and Food Security in Africa. And they looked at 114 projects in 24 African countries and found that yields often more than doubled when organic or near organic practices such as crop rotation and composting were used. Now, if a transgene had been d introduced and was doubling yields, you would see massive headlines all over the world. However, when non-proprietary methods such as organics are used um, to do things like increase the land's resistance to drought, and that's research, I did research on that at, at the Rodale Institute and we showed that. And again, we didn't have much, there was you know, no, almost no notice taken of that, although if it had been a transgene, it would have been huge. Now, I, I want to emphasize that, that um, I don't think organic methods will be the future for uh, world, uh, you know, basis for world food security, although it will, I think, it should be an important component. Uh, future food production will be a combination of existing methods, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, non-transgenic biotechnology. We can reduce the, fer the fertilizer, herbicide, pesticide use by 80 to 90 percent and avoid uh, causing dead zones and the eutrophication of rivers um, and all these other effects by using our, our technology and our ability to um, uh, reduce these things and to control pests and weeds. And so there are, we're going to combine agroecological methods with the conventional methods, uh, including bi non-transgenic biotechnology. And again, non-proprietary, non-patentable solutions such as agroecology need to be funded. We need that fund. We need that federal money, and that should not be going to the industry. Um, if you want uh, more information on this, two books by Jeffrey Smith, Genetic Roulette, the latest one, has most of the research that I've talked about up to about uh, early 2007. Uh, and then his Seeds of Deception is, is, relates how all this happened, a lot, a lot of the stuff in Washington, D.C. 
I still have a paper in peer review. You can check my website, um, the one that I put, uh, donlauder.net slash gm for updates on this. Okay.